the shape and size and arrangement of the room does make a big difference to how you interact with students, and you have to cope with that. That's one of the things, you know, always when, you know, I would always go and check out any lecture room I was assigned because we didn't usually have much control over it. You know, go in there and see, how am I going to cope with teaching in this very rectangular shape or this, you know, arch shape or this highly staggered, tiered shape of classroom? If I, you know, do find myself in a, a room where it's very structured, um, I'll just say to the students right at the outset, you know, I'm going to be, you know, doing um, work where I'm going to pair you up, or you'll be, you know, pairs, and then you'll group. I'll, I'll have you join another pair. I just tell them right up front that we're not going to let the classroom structure affect what I know is, you know, is good good teaching and learning. Even though I prefer classrooms where there's, there's tables, um, I can make other, other classrooms work if, if I have to. I began to request classrooms that had movable seating uh, and a situation where I was not at a podium in the front, uh, but that I could mingle more. Uh, in a classroom like this, you can't walk up the middle, you've only the sides. And, for certain kinds of teaching, like I said, that's good, but it wasn't uh, the kind of teaching that I wanted to do. Why would you put those artificial uh, constraints on what you wanted to achieve in the classroom? Physical space is all important. I used to really enjoy with my students in analytical chem, uh, with some of the senior level courses, and getting them out of the classroom. And we used to do a lot of lab-based work, but occasionally I'd get them outside and talk about sampling and about, well, how are we going to do this? I mean, look at all the variables we got. How are we going to control this? Getting out and changing the environment. And I found that students really reacted to that sort of dynamic environment uh, that went on in sort of non-classical teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, it really it does beg the question, why do we maintain such um, old thinking when it comes to classroom spaces. Why is that acceptable? Um, I'm really pleased that as a university we're beginning to question that and we're investing in what will lead to success uh, in the future for our, for our educators and for our students. Having classrooms that enhance the interaction of students and students and faculty, um, along with a little technology that, that helps but doesn't become a crutch. Uh, either for the students or the faculty member. So I think it's a matter of faculty members constantly learning how to deal with the technologies and how to best serve the students, um, even though the students might want to be served in slightly different ways. <laughs> that may not be the best way for them to learn. In the classroom, the, the structure of the classroom does make a difference. Things have changed quite a great, uh, great deal as far as class sizes go. I never imagined when I was a student here that there would be a need for a class of 300 at this university. But now I'm teaching one. So I do know that often you have that many students in a single semester who want to take a course. Uh, I had, as a student, sometimes the professor all to myself in a few classes. I was the only student enrolled. And so you just don't often get that, but we do have an offer independent studies where students can get more of a one-on-one -on -one with professors and they can still sort of have that experience that we used to have quite routinely. And back in the day, there was many, many classes I had that were 10 students or less. So I was in psychology then. We had a rule that the class maximum size was 30 and ideally it would be 20. And we were, didn't have a lot of students and so that was easy to do. Um, so we had small classes, which meant you had, you knew every student and you had them repeatedly. So I was teaching five to six courses and so I would get the same students over and over again. So I would know them. I would know all their little foibles. I would know um, who to expect questions from, who I'd never hear from and so on. And so you could pick on the ones that were quiet because you knew that they weren't going to interact. I don't do that in classes of 80 or 100. You just go in and... and do it to the sea of faces. And the difficulty is that you don't want them to stand out, you don't want to embarrass them, but at the same time you want them to contribute. And I think, I wish I had more small classes, because if you have a small class, you can make it more friendly, you can make, it, you can make them feel more comfortable speaking up. 
I remember being quite stiff and nervous in my, my first teaching experience for sure and really not knowing um, what to do in the room. But I remember that the, the layout of the room uh, concerned me a, a little bit. And I do remember that the students were sitting in rows and I didn't, you know, I wasn't really thinking that there was anything wrong with that, that I would definitely teach, you know, being at the front of the room, they would be in their desks, go all the way to the, the, the back of the room. Well, that was quite a few years ago. Uh, universities were not much different from public schools or high schools in terms of rows of seats, teacher in the front, blackboard, now whiteboard, um, no technology in the classroom. So in some ways, um, even though it was the end of the 20th century, it was kind of primitive, uh, very standard. And at the time, I didn't realize how uncomfortable it was going to make me in that kind of an environment in the future. Um, having your students sit often behind a table, uh, bolted to the floor, having the students in somewhat of a controlled environment was uh, kind of a safety thing, but that certainly changed. That made me very uncomfortable after a while. Uh, so students smoked in class, and I wore contacts at the time, and I asked the students who were smoking to move to the back, and it caused chaos because people thought I couldn't tell them where to sit. And so people today say, people smoked in the class? I said, yeah, pipes, cigars, cigarettes, and faculty, I'm told, would bum cigarettes off the students. So that was a big thing. When I uh, first came on every desk, there was a little tinfoil ashtray, and uh, all the students would light up. And, uh, well, I would say all, oh, but in those days, in the 60s, uh, it was unusual if you, uh, if you didn't smoke. And, uh, and of course, by the end of the day, especially during the exams, the, the room was pretty blue. And, uh, and I remember asking, I won't mention who's the name, but I remember asking the president if we could have one room, just one room, non-smoking, for students with asthma and uh, who couldn't take this smoke. Out of the question, he said, out of the question. They're allowed to smoke anywhere. We can't tread on their rights. They, they have to smoke wherever they want. <laughs> and this is not that long ago, actually. When I first started at U of L, we had student desks in the classrooms in University Hall that had ashtrays on the side. And students smoked. And professors smoked. And there's always this cloud of smoke in the room. And, and you couldn't say anything about it because, uh, <laughs> I mean, that was just, we were, that, that was your right to smoke in the classroom. So that, you know, that evolved over a period of decade. And first of all, they would let them smoke in classes only in the hallways. And then it went into the out, outside only. And then so many feet away from the bu building and this sort of thing. So it, you can just see how this progress, uh, it progressed over a period of a decade. It seems it's quite similar, really, other than the board changing and the, uh, and because a lot of people use the overheads and uh, the uh, uh, computers, but uh, no, for me, it's, it's still I still lecture much the same way as that I wanted to, is with, uh, with with no notes, just coming in with a, with the chalk or, or the pen now, and funnily enough, I, I I can write, you know, calligraphically with the chalk. But with a pen, it just scribbles all over. I, I can't, uh, it doesn't have the friction. When you're teaching certain courses, and I did teach science, I taught biomechanics when I first got here, um, having the student sitting, facing forward, having to write, listening to me, um, not a lot of interaction with the students. But when I began teaching other types of courses, more social sciences um, and humanities type courses, this type of a classroom, um, it was awful. The students couldn't interact with each other. It always put the focus on the faculty member. I've always believed that uh, none of us is the smartest person in a room unless we're by ourselves. There's always going to be different stories, different experiences. And if we don't provide an environment for the students to share, uh, then as teachers, we can't learn and they can't learn from each other, which I think is very important. So the design of the classroom, some have changed, but for the most part, we're still back where we were in the Middle Ages, I think. The worst place in the world to teach is E690. It's just horrible, and I taught in there a lot. And three years ago, I taught a course 
that was taught simultaneously in Edmonton and Calgary and here. And I had to teach it in there, and I forgot how horrible that room is. It's, it's long and narrow upwards, right? Uh, it's a little bit like the music um, theater. Um, it, the acoustics are great, but if you're trying to interact with a person in the back row, forget it. They're on their phone. You're not engaging them at all. Down there on level six, there used to be a tiered classroom. I don't know whether it still exists or not. I think it does. And there were aisles up the side, and the desks ran right across. There was no middle thing. So um, come exam time, when I'd correct the exams and hand them back, well, I could spend hours running back and forth. So what I did, I walked on the top of the desktops and passed out the, the exams to people. They thought that was really funny. Uh, and why not have uh, instruction have some fun moments to it? Certainly the technology in the classroom has made a big difference. Um, you know, a student asks a question, it used to be, you know, I'm going to have to look into that. And now we can just go Google something and we can discuss uh, whether or not what we're reading is appropriate for what we're doing. And of course, the students are all wired in electronically in their heads and everywhere all the time. So they respond better uh, when we use technology. I mean, I'm still very aware of the classrooms that I teach in, and um, I will make certain requests to be in certain classrooms because I want the ability to have my students sit in groups and around tables. So I actually request those classrooms to teach in. Um, I often now I teach in and amongst my students. Very seldom will I be up at the front. I wanted to get into the scale-up room and it took 36 people and it took me two years to get my department to let me get the class limit small enough that I could use it and I will be using it in the fall and it's going to be a great pleasure because it will follow the way I teach rather than me having to make the way I teach fit into a conventional classroom. But it's, it's fighting tooth and nail to get a small enough class that they can do this participation, this friendship, this free exchange, this trust, I guess you could call it. The classroom down there that was nice. That I like that for assignments. You know, the, what is it? Anderson Hall, 117 uh, or 177. Uh, I enjoy that one for the very friendly, you know, you can walk around to the tables and uh, uh, I, I enjoy that. In math, we can't sort of have it all a little, little tables, but with the tutorials, we do. One of the things that I um, pushed very hard for uh, in beginning in 1989, actually, was that every classroom had to have two doors. I was teaching uh, an introduction to women's studies class the night of the Ecole Polytechnique massacre. And I happened to be in a classroom that had two doors. And there weren't very many of those on campus at the time. And chairs that moved around. I did OK there. But there was no safety in that classroom. There were no telephones yet. There were no, no emergency things. And I began to think, what would happen if that happened on this campus? If you're in a classroom with one door, students aren't safe. Um, it was right after that that I think every classroom built after that point had two doors and, of course, the technology um, built up. So I felt a little bit safer. When I first started teaching, I tried out using a mic and the students started yelling, like, Kevin, Kevin, stop it, you're deafening us, right? Because I just, I couldn't not just project, like, scream to the, to sort of modulate to the room. So I don't, I don't mic up in PE 250. And I think that helps me because I can draw connection with the students in a way. There's, again, not that mediation, right? So they're, they're hearing my voice, not hearing it through the speakers. And then with that, it's not quite as loud as through the speakers. So then they can't make as much noise, right? That sort of muffled noise, so they have to be tied in. So being able to not mic up and still run around the classroom and talk, I think that, that, that gives me a benefit in teaching in that environment. And I loved teaching in P250. I think it is a really big classroom. It's big, there's space between the seats. I could walk around that room and you know, really interact with the students. I didn't like being stuck at the front. I hate 
being motionless when I'm talking. <laughs> I like to you know, use, use everything to emphasize points. And so not only voice modulation and you know, expression and so forth, but also you know, engaging the students in, you know, do you think that this is an important point? You know, uh, why should we care about this? And I think that's best done if you, if you can get as close as you can in a you know, couple of hundred seat space like you know, PE 250 is. Uh, but that, I, that lecture theater, you know, it's, it, I really like that. By having the classrooms more towards you, you don't have to use any microphone or anything. You can actually talk to the students and you can walk around and engage, engage with the students. Now that we do have big classes still in, in PE, we've got the two big lecture theaters which have the incumbent problems. Um, but the, the other classes, I think the, the architecture of them has improved a lot. A lot of the facilities, um up to a few years ago that we had for teaching on campus were very traditional in that setup. Um, very much uh, lecture theatre, seat based with a stage at the front if you like, or a performance area at the front with board. And I think as we got to a point where we were thinking about where we wanted to take the university with respect to new buildings, an obvious question was how would the teaching programme fit uh, or, or, or evolve um, in a new space. I, I mean, a number of us asked some questions uh, about our current facilities and is this the best we can do? Is this really where teaching is going to be taking us in the next few years? And what I think, well, I, what I know we've seen in the last uh, two to three years is a questioning of the facilities that we have and the environments that we work with students in and asking, is this the best we can do? And so I'm, ve I'm very excited about that. Um, flip classrooms, uh, Socratic seminar room is, is the latest piece I understand that's coming up. All of, all of these ideas, I think, um, are challenging the traditional view of what teaching looks like. And so this building, in preparation for some of the new teaching areas within the new building, which will look in many ways identical to some of the research areas, I think we're asking and doing the experiments beforehand that'll set us up for success in the new building. With the new science building going in, I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing very traditional industrial revolution structure classrooms. I hope they don't do that because even in the sciences, getting students to work together, getting students to Work on problems together, you know, um, is hard to do uh, when you're locked into a space. Um, I would like to see some classrooms with no desks and chairs, but tiered maybe. Um, uh, classrooms where uh, students are standing up maybe, you know, at, at high tables uh, and they have to move around a little bit. and. Um, that also causes students to pay attention because they can't fall asleep if they're standing up, right? Um, so I'm hoping that, uh, and I haven't seen a lot of the internal design on the, on the destination place, but I'm hoping that they're a little more creative uh, with, with the classrooms. And as the science faculties, departments vacate their spaces in University Hall, that a lot of creative thought goes into how do we design classrooms in those spaces? How do we design really usable study spaces, graduate student spaces? We certainly have a lot more investment going into asking questions about teaching environment um, than we've had uh, over a number of years at the university. And I think, again, that's, that's part of the elevation of teaching within the institution. We're asking good questions about environment and how that reflects um, good teaching practice. And I think we're on a good journey there, but we have a long way to go. But I know that um, even down to some of the equipment that we put in, into the uh, classroom, the colors that we paint them, the seating arrangements, the flexibilities, we're now asking. We're not just accepting what we have. And I, I think that's a very, very healthy revolution for the, for the university. I like the U of L in the way that it does attend to innovative change. I mean, I, I can see it growing up 
uh, in a way. So I guess it was kind of a teenager when I got here in, in historical terms. And um, I like very much the fact that they're attending to new things. There's some natural growth that I like in terms of the sciences. So I've watched us outgrow some of our space and outgrow uh, what our students need to know and then adapt to that. So there's, a flex there's still, I think, a flexibility here that I, that I like. You, and if you tell someone you can't really do that, they'll figure out a way to do it. And so we keep doing that. We keep being innovative. And I keep now seeing newer professors coming. And there's more of us, but there are more students too. And so watching the professors go out and play Pokemon at the break along with the students, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of fun. But also I notice the, the digging and the change and the, the whole... Um, physical space of the university is, is changing, but I also think the intellectual geography is changing too as we take on more and more complex real problems. I think we take our learning experiences. What we did in the past is likely not suitable to what we're doing in the future. We've changed and why would the environment remain the same? Um, if we wanted different modes of interacting with students and you have to create the environment for that to happen in and you have to be purposeful about it happening, and we have to be verbal about it as well as educators. It's, it, it should be important to us, as important to us to get our teaching spaces right as it is to have our research spaces. Like our lab, you know, I, I, I know what goes in the lab. I know what works for me. I can design a lab. But I want someone to listen to me when I talk about what teaching environment I want. I want someone to understand that I don't want to be isolated at the front of a classroom and not have access to my students. I want to be in and amongst them. I want, to, I want to interact with them. I want to be with them. And, you know, I, I think we're in a very good uh, spot with that now. We'll begin to have those very honest conversations. And I, I would say to you what I've observed at the moment is a lot of the industry goes, you want what? What? That's not what we, that's not what we design. That's not what we do. Well, you know what? It's time for you to rethink that because that's not what we do anymore. I think that's, that's been a very, very healthy part of what's been going on with the, the science academic building that will naturally flow over into the very exciting aspects of how we'll change University Hall, which we're at the very beginning of thinking about, you know, what could that be? And that's another one of those pieces that, um, you know, all those questions will be answered in the next 50 years as to what we will be there. Creativity in the design of classrooms and study spaces. Um, Standard classrooms have, you know, worked for hundreds of years, but uh, education has changed a great deal. And to me, that indicates that we need a change in the learning environment. Students might be very enthusiastic about that and uh, come up with more questions. And it's something that they will remember. This class was different because, and maybe that's one way of getting students to engage better the environment can cause them to engage better with the materials. And ultimately, I think that uh, that's what we want. We don't want the students only studying for their exams and uh, only going to the library if they even use the library anymore as opposed to the internet when they're doing research papers. Um, uh, getting them to think and to be comfortable. Uh, and one way to do that is with different designs of classrooms.